to be at home. Not only was it sincere, but that faith was also living and vibrant. It was exuding out of every orifice of the lifestyle of Timothy that Paul would say, I saw this first in your grandmother. How many of you know this? To be first at anything requires sacrifice. And when I think about sacrifice, I think about the phenomenal quote from Adoniram Judson that says this, what a word this is for us today in regards to sacrifice. The concept of sacrifice is found in this principle, this statement that is so significant. That is the sacrifice that causes someone to be successful. If you and I have success Without sacrifice, it's because someone went before us and sacrificed so we can be successful. If you have not yet obtained success, then usually what we find out is this. Your sacrifice will allow someone else to be successful. The epitome of everything that makes moms who they are. But when we think about Lois, Lois was the first to become a Christ follower. Now you got to understand the context. The Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey into Timothy's hometown known as Lystra. Lystra was very adamantly opposed to the message of Christianity. The Apostle Paul would preach the message of Jesus. Many would give their life to Jesus Christ, including Lois and her daughter Eunice. But don't miss this. When the Apostle Paul begins to face persecution in Lystra, this family receives Jesus, but the rest of Lystra would find themselves persecuting the Apostle Paul. They would throw stones at the Apostle Paul that would be ultimately leading him unto death, they thought. They threw the Apostle Paul over the city wall, and in Rocky Four format, the Apostle Paul comes back into the city of Lystra preaching the gospel. But what we find out about Lois, her name means acceptable. She is Jewish. She has a daughter named Eunice, who's also Jewish. But what we find out by names, names mean something. Eunice means conquering or victorious. It's where we get the word Nike. It's a Greek word. Eunice, spelled E-U-N-I-C-E. -E. The N-I-C-E -E in Greek would phonetically be spelled out or sounded Nike. It's a Greek word, which means that you have a Jewish woman. Watch this. Y'all still with me? Say amen. I'm trying to teach you something about what does it mean to be sacrificial in our faith, to be the first one in our families to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Lois said this, I didn't know anything about this Jesus. Then this guy named the Apostle Paul told me about Jesus. I received Jesus. I'm in a Greek culture, though I'm Jewish. I named my daughter Eunice, which means conquering or victorious, a Greek name. But I had a grandson named Timothy. And my daughter Eunice, who gave her life to Jesus, somehow wanted to break the chains of the cycle of dysfunctionality in our family and made a commitment on her own to raise up her son in the admonition of the Lord, which, by the way, Timothy's father, you'll read about this in Acts 16, verse 1, it would say this, that Timothy's mother was a God-fearing woman, but her husband, Timothy's daddy, didn't want anything to do with God. Matter of fact, and I know this is a little graphic, we find out that Timothy has to be circumcised later on with the Apostle Paul, which was a sign and symbol of the Jewish faith. The father was against that, which means that Eunice and her husband were not on the same page in regards to this message of Jesus. But Eunice said this, but I'm going to name my son Timothy, not a Greek name, but a Hebrew name, which means this, a God-fearing man. She made a commitment. What am I trying to teach us today? Some of us in this room understand the sacrifice of the first one in our family to call upon the name of Jesus. My grandmother, her name Elizabeth Lawson, we called her Granny Boo. 
My grandmother, so instrumental, faith-filled woman, loved Jesus charismatically. My grandfather wanted nothing to do with the things of God, but yet she would be faithful. Sunday after Sunday, she'd be instrumental in leading my mother to the Lord. My mom gets married to my father, who was not a Christ follower, gives his life at a revival service just for deaf people. He comes to the altar, gives his life to Jesus, and now I am reared and raised in a Christian home. I always think about the sacrifice of my grandmother to be so committed to the things of God when her husband wanted nothing to do with Jesus, but yet she stayed faithful. And think about this. My grandmother, who's in heaven today, she's got an indirect impact on your life because of the investment in my mom and my mom invested in me. Never doubt the power of you being first in your faith and the influence that you have. Amen. And not only do we see the sincere faith, point number two, a sacrificial faith. Number three, a secure faith. A secure faith. Still in verse number five. Watch this. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother. By the way, failed to mention this. This is the only time you'll see the word grandmother in the Bible. Many grandmothers, but think about this. The only time the word grandmother is used in the Bible. Many grandmothers, but the only time the word is used is in connection to Lois and watch how her impact on Eunice and then her grandson Timothy to where today in 2017 we're reading a letter written to Timothy that's got a significant impact on us all. But notice this phrase, I am sure dwells in you as well. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, but I am sure dwells in you as well. A secure faith. It's a remark of confidence, and it's also a replicated commitment. Paul says this, Timothy, I saw this first in your grandmother. I saw it in your mother. I now see it in you. That is the duplication of the word dwell twice in one verse is a remark that stresses something that's been passed on. When we talk about influence, for example, I'm a runner. I run a long run on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Even yesterday, as I was running down this little gravel road, if you've ever doubted the impact of something small, get a pebble in your shoe and see how small that impact you may think it has on you. It causes you to stop, take your shoe off, and shake it out. Something so small can cause such an impact. When it comes to you and me living a life of influence and impact, our life is like a vapor. Here for a moment, then gone. And as we talk about the vapor, here for a moment and gone, yes, you can stand in this space, in this place, and feel the impact of the vapor. But what if you and I were to consider what the Bible is teaching us, that this faith dwelled in you? When you and I talk about impact and influence, understand something. We can bring our children and our grandchildren to church, and Lord Jesus, I hope and pray that the preacher can be impactful from this stage to create a desire in the hearts of your kids wanting to live for Jesus, but it's just a vapor. The most impactful thing is something I shared with these families that stood behind me. It's not just what is taught, it's what's caught. And it's taking the lid off and in that moment choosing not just to spray the vapor, but we would pour our life into our children. I love this quote. I want to share it with you from Barbara Johnson. She said this, if we want to be in the memories of our kids tomorrow, we have to be active and present in their lives today. Today. We want to be active and present in their lives today. If we want to be in their memories tomorrow, we got to be active and present in their lives today. Passing on a secure faith. But last but not least, we now see this principle that Paul says to Timothy, not only did your grandmother and your mother pass on a sincere faith, a sacrificial faith, a secure faith, I see it in you. What was in them is in you. They deposited that in you. 
but I also see a sound faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, you know this verse to be true. It validates the infallibility of God's word, which is a big word for the Bible is without error. It is all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching and training and instruction in righteousness. But in 2 Timothy 3.15, you'll find these words to be true. I'll put it in your notes. And that is, Paul would say to Timothy, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. That is, Timothy would be a preacher of the gospel, rightly expounding God's word. But did he, did he go to seminary? No, he did not. Did he go to a Bible college? No, he did not. But the greatest form of instruction that Timothy received was from his mother and his grandmother that poured their life into him, teaching him the sacred writings. That is, he would see his mother and his grandmother in the word. It's one thing to get in the word. It's another thing for the word to get in you. It's one thing for you and I to highlight verses but it's something else for these verses to highlight us. And I'll close with this. When my grandmother, Elizabeth Lawson, passed away, which, by the way, for those of you that have heard my kids' names, London, Lola, Liv, and my son's name is Lawson. We've honored my grandmother in the adoption of our son, Teshini, given by his grandmother, appointed leader, Lawson means seeker of truth. Names mean something. And so to honor my grandmother and to preserve the legacy of my son's grandmother in Ethiopia, Africa, my son's given name is Lawson Teshemi or Teshoma Newton. Lawson, Elizabeth Lawson. My grandmother was a beautician in a town called Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. Many of you might have heard of Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, because you grew up watching Andy Griffith. You heard Mount Airy, Mayberry, and Mount Pilot. My grandmother was a beautician. Listen to her little beauty shop's name. Bonnie's and Boo's Beauty Shop. She had a business partner named Bonnie. She was known as Boo. B-O-O. -O. She was the youngest of four sisters, a little bit skittish, and her big sisters were always teasing her, and she was always a little scared of her sisters, so her nickname was Boo. Everybody knew Boo Lawson. We called her Granny Boo. My grandmother was such an influence in my life, she would hold my hand in the summer months because both my parents were working in the summer and they didn't trust me at home. So they put me with my grandmother and my grandfather to work their little farm and to hang out with them in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. And my grandmother on a Sunday morning would drag me down to First Baptist Church, Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. And she would drag me there and she'd make a joyful noise from the back of the pew that we sat on. And I don't know how this always worked out, but... Lunch was always ready when we got home. She had something simmering and sauteing in that crock pot. Amen. And we would walk in, and sure enough, and I would get washed up, and lunch would be ready. Now, my grandfather, he'd already begin to devour that pot roast, but my grandmother would say, Son, grab my hand, and we'd begin to pray. My grandmother would pray prayers like this. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd save my grandson, Edward. And I pray one day you'd call him to be a preacher of the gospel. <laughs> and I said to my grandmother, one particular time, I said, Grandma, I love you. Would you stop praying that I'll be a preacher? <laughs> I love you. Would you stop praying that, please? <laughs> Say, Grandma, preachers are the most socially awkward people that I've ever met in my life. They don't even like Well, he's sports. anything but socially awkward. She laughed. My, my grandmother gave up her retirement so she could get me through college. 
I'm the first in my family to graduate from college. My mom and dad never finished the seventh or eighth grade. I would get him an anonymous check every single semester of this small little Bible college that I went to. Business office would say it's an anonymous check. But it came from a town called Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. Oh, I know who that is. Do you know anybody from Pilot Mountain, North Carolina? I said, sir, you haven't met my grandmother. When my grandmother died, it's the very first funeral that I've ever had to preach. Now, I've preached many, but it was the very first one I've ever had to preach. But my grandmother made it real clear. You're going to share Jesus, and you're going to give an invitation at my funeral. <laughs> Revival broke out at my grandmother's funeral. <laughs> and Pilot Mountain broke your life. Wow. That's crazy. Afterwards, as the graveside and the family gathered for a meal, the last will and testament of my grandmother was being read. Property, jewelry, furniture, all of those things being distributed. My name was called. I was shocked. My name was called. She had done so much for me. My very first vehicle that I had that was of any dependability, my grandmother bought it for me. Here's the reason why. Because I was a youth pastor at a church 45 minutes from the Bible college that I went to. And she bought me a vehicle that would get me to and from on Wednesdays and Sundays so I could go minister to a group of 50 teenagers at the church that I worked at. My grandmother made an investment in me. And so when my name was called, I wasn't expecting anything. She gave everything she had for me. And when my name was called, I received her Bible. And on the inside, I see my name. Now listen, I'm all for technology. I, I read the Bible. I read it this morning on my app. I'm grateful for apps. But it's hard to pass on an app. It's hard to pass on an iPod or an iTouch or an iPad. But as I look through the pages, even this day, my grandmother wrote this note on the inside of her Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And mark it. And when I turn through the pages, I see where she's underlined. I can even see right, right now she has spent so much time that it smudged the ink. And I stare at this Bible and go, Grandma, if I could be half the person you were, I think I could change the world. She taught me a sound faith. She taught me to base my life on the Word of God. And I want to say this to you moms and grandmoms in the house. Never underestimate your influence. For many of you, you might be the first Christian in your family. But my prayer for you is you won't be the last. That from you will be trees of faith and hope rooted deep in God's Word. And many of you today came to church, and I know why you're here because your mother and your grandmother drug you to this place, just like my grandmother drug me. I ought to put you to that one. And I want to say thank you for honoring your mom and your grandmother by being in the house of God today. It means so much to be happy. When we talk about this principle, Sincere faith, sacrificial faith, a secure faith, a sound faith. Yeah. Timothy lived his life for Jesus that he learned from his mom and his grandmother. It's the power of a legacy. And many of your legacies begin today. If you've never called upon the name of Jesus today, we want to give you that opportunity. It's in the heart of your mom and your grandmother that you would know Jesus. But most of all, it's the heart of your father that's so good that gave his son Jesus to die for him 
you to know that your sins are forgiven and heaven is your final destiny. So with heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, it's simply just admitting that you don't have it all together. It's being sincere. It's not trying to cover over. It's just being honest, not perfect. It's believing that Jesus died for you. I hope you know that. He died for you. Your sins, past, present, and future. And the Bible teaches that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not if, not but, not maybe. Shall be saved. And if you've never made that decision, it's more than just intellectual understanding. It's receiving. Lois received Jesus. Eunice received Jesus. Timothy received Jesus. you got to receive Jesus. If you've not done that today, based on the authority of God's word, heaven can be in your heart because of you receiving Jesus. If you've never done that before, but today you're ready and willing to make that decision, would you call on the name of the Lord? You can say this out loud or you can say this in your own heart. But today, if you've never made that decision, would you humble yourself and receive Jesus Christ, the greatest gift, offering eternal life? If that's your desire today, would you just say this to him and mean it from the depth of your heart? Just say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, and I believe that you died for me. And right now, I'm asking you to save me, change me, I give you my life. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if one person made that decision in this moment, the Bible teaches that all of heaven celebrates. And if that's a decision that you just made today, we want you to know it is the greatest decision of your life. You cannot be ashamed of Jesus, for Jesus was not ashamed of you. And if that's a decision that you made right here, right now, would you be willing to raise your hand, hold it up high, don't you be embarrassed. Don't you be ashamed. If you prayed that prayer in faith, receiving Jesus for the very first time, would you raise your hand right where you're seated, right where you're standing? Hold up your hand as tall as you can so I can see. Anybody in the house today that would just say, today, Pastor Aaron, I gave my life to Jesus. For those of you that have your hands raised, it is the greatest decision of your life. Attached to the listener God that is where we were filling in the blanks, there's a tarot portion. Write your name, check the box, I accepted Jesus. You can take that to our guest relations counter, receive a free Bible. We'd love to give that to you. Or you can go to the offering box and you can drop that in as your gift as the rest of the church gives the tithes and offerings of this ministry. You put that in that offering box and somebody's going to call you this week to tell you how proud we are of you. But we want to tell you right here, right now, we don't want to miss a moment and tell you how proud we are of this 9 o'clock service. Can we just clap our hands and celebrate? <laughs> somebody about it. Don't forget to pick up that free Bible. But I want to do something very significant. Our series called Radical from Mother's Day to Father's Day. Now you know I don't try to motivate you out of guilt. I will never be that preacher. I want to motivate you by grace. Don't you miss a single service if you can help it. Because here is the warning label. If you miss a single service, you're going to have to hear about it through some social media platform and you're going to kick yourself for the fact that you were not in church and here's the reason why. Because in this series called Radical from Mother's Day to Father's Day, we are going to demonstrate a testimony of radical generosity in a way that you've never seen it before. And I'm telling you, just like the Holy Spirit series was a trajectory changer for our church, I believe this series on radical generosity what we're going to do for people in these days, you don't want to miss it. You want to hear it firsthand. And it begins today. We thought about getting my mother's flowers, bookmarks. Last year we did bracelets, and we may do that in the future. But we were thinking, as we talk about what it means to be a mother, that opens their heart, opens their home, opens their hands, we thought the best thing that we could do for moms here at Community Bible Church is to give a gift on behalf of them. 
to four mother ministries in our city that are loving on women in a way that is exquisite and extravagant. Matter of fact, we have made a deposit in four what I call mother ministries in our city, loving women that are raising babies to the tune of $25,000. Holy God. That a lot of money, boy. partners with many organizations across San Antonio. Christian Assistance Ministry, SAM Ministries, Youth for Christ Parent Life, and Pregnancy Care Center are just four of the ministries making an impact in the lives of moms and families in our community, all with the purpose of sharing the love of Christ. Every day, Christian Assistance Ministry volunteers prepare sack lunches, groceries, and clothing for families experiencing crisis. SAM Ministries helps families gain independence and financial stability. They provide safe and secure housing, along with employment training, educational support, and other on-site resources. Youth for Christ Parent Life empowers expectant and parenting teens by encouraging education, and providing programs on money management and parenting skills. Pregnancy Care Center ministers to women and couples facing an unplanned pregnancy through free services such as counseling, pregnancy tests, sonograms, and other support programs. Lives are not just changed, they are saved.